Uh, I'm Steve Foley. I'm the IBM rep for Kix UK and Ireland. Um, this presentation was originally called Hot Off The Press or something like that, uh, because the time the agenda was published, we hadn't announced Kix TS 5.5. Uh, we have now, and that's that's what's hot off the press, and that's what we'll be mainly talking about over the next 50 odd minutes. Um, before we get into it, this is just a brief summary of uh, what we have announced uh, this year. Uh, these are the kicks related announcements, um, and I think it illustrates uh, what we've been doing for a few releases now with continuous delivery. So you'll see that we 5.5 was announced in October. But every three months, we've been announcing continuous delivery content, primarily for 5.4. Uh, so every 90 days, uh, a lot of content which in the past would only have been made available in, in the next release uh, has been made available where appropriate in, uh, in current releases. So where are we in terms of uh, service? Version 4, uh, 4.2, breached end of life. A uh, couple of months ago, um, 5.5 will become available on the 14th of December. Um, probably the key date to look out for now is for those of you on uh, version 5.1 or 5.2, particularly 5.1, uh, end of service is, is fast approaching. Uh, that's seven months away. So, um, what we're going to talk about, what, what's new in 5.5? Um, We'll talk about support for Node.js. So this, this is probably the biggest single uh, new function we have available in, 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 in Kix in 5.5, support for JavaScript applications. So we'll talk a bit, like, a bit about that. There, uh, Paul Cooper will be here tomorrow and we'll go into greater depth on how we are supporting uh, Node.js and Kix. So I'll try to give you a gentle introduction uh, here. Then we'll talk about what's been improved in the Kix Explorer, and I think the session after this one, uh, we'll, we'll go into more detail on that as well. Uh, so I'll just briefly cover what's new in the Kix Explorer. And probably spend most of the time talking about uh, what we call uh, foundation items. Um, so, so there's a large number of RFDs and enhancements which have been delivered, uh, 500 now, over 500 in the version five time frame. So improvements in systems management, in security, and something new in, in the API and SBI uh, space, which we'll talk about. Um, I'll probably run out of time, so probably won't get to enhancements probably. in Java. Uh, so uh, those of you who are interested in, in the Java enhancements, the, f the slides are available uh, on, the, on the GSE website, uh, but we'll see how we go. I'll also cover at the end, um, what we have delivered in continuous delivery, because uh, I know some of you are actively going to 5.4 and may, may already be there, so some of the function we're going to cover for 5.5 is now available in 5.4, so we'll, we'll highlight what, what exactly that is. So Node.js, um, so just a quick level set. Um, first of all, in JavaScript, Many of you will be familiar with JavaScript. It's a, it's a scripting language which runs in, in, in all our web browsers. Um, it's fairly a bit ubiquitous. Um, probably important to say it's not Java, so don't, don't be confused. It's, it's a completely different language uh, from Java, although it shares a, a similar syntax. Uh, and what it's particularly good at is uh, issuing asynchronous calls uh, to a web server. And, and it can do things like asynchronously load a page uh, as you're browsing through it, for example. Now, until recently, it was a client-only language. It only ran on the browser end. So a frustration for web developers was if you're developing a web application, you had to learn two languages. You had to know JavaScript, and then you know, know another language in order to communicate at the server end, PHP, for example. So one of the reasons for Node.js is to provide, on the server end, uh, a, an engine which can run JavaScript, uh, usually on a web server. Um, key points about Node.js, it's, it's lightweight and efficient. Um, and something that, um, interesting point, familiar to most of us, is it's a single-threaded 
non-blocking I.O. model. So if you think of kicks quasi the entrancy, yeah, you'll have a good idea of how Node.js is operating. So not good for CPU intensive applications, best suited for data I.O. intensive applications. Every time it does I.O. it has the opportunity to uh, run another uh, request. So Node.js uh, is supported in a large number of servers and, and, and uh, last year IBM introduced support for Node.js and ZOS. So that's been in, available for just about 12 months or so. Um, I should mention it is a licensed product, so unlike Java, um, you do, do need, there is a cost associated with, with Node.js. It is licensed and, and it comes with the C and C++ compilers. However, we are heavily promoting uh, a 90 day evaluation uh, offering uh, for non-production use. There's no cost associated with that, so if you think you may have a use case for, for Node or just want to have a, a play with it, uh, that should be simple to arrange. Going forward, th there's, there's, um, there's not going to be any nonsense with zaps and zips, etc. Uh, we've taken advantage of con container pricing uh, for, for workloads like Node going forward, so effectively you only pay for what you use. It doesn't affect uh, your overall NLC costs, for example. So why use Node.js and Kix? Um, the, the types of applications we anticipate customers be interested in are perhaps simple dashboards, probably intranet based. We, we provide support for PHP in the recent past, um, similar type of concept, and I, I, I work with some customer, one, one customer in particular who created a quick and simple dashboard using PHP and Kix. So those, those types of applications will be well suited to, to JavaScript. Um, but we also see it as a, it is, there's, there's a large number of JavaScript developers uh, in the market uh, and the support we're introducing in Kix uh, will not require any particular Kix knowledge in order to write Node uh, applications for Kix. And one of the things that's particularly good is kind of ag aggregation uh, type logic. So um, I, can, I can certainly imagine where, where you have existing APIs and, and services, uh, Node would be an excellent way of um, aggregating those services to provide a, a single service, a thing, single new service to multiple new clients. Um, so just, just to start to touch on the architecture and uh, how we'd actually deploy a Node.js application in Kix. Um, the, the Node engine will run inside a Kix region as a, inside an LE enclave. As the, the Node runs as, a, as its USS application. It'll run inside an LE enclave inside Kix. And in terms of the deployment model for Node applications, Kix will be based on Kix bundles. So if you're familiar how you deploy Java applications to Kix, it's exactly the same model and have the same life cycle in terms of using CDA, CMT, etc. Explorer to go through the, the life cycle of enabling, disabling uh, node applications. Enabling the bundle which contains a node application will create the runtime e engine and, and make make the application available, disabling the bundle will shut down uh, the node engine for that application. You can run multiple node applications in inside the same Kix region. Uh, I believe it's 64-bit storage, so and, and it is a lightweight uh, engine, so it should be possible to scale uh, quite easily with multiple node applications. Uh, so yeah, so say the, the, the well, the reach so, so they're running as a USS process. So they'll have I don't know if it'll be an SRB or a TCB, but it'll be a single oh, thread. TCB, yeah. So key point to cover then is if you're going to run Node applications in Kix, you probably want to interact with existing uh, Kix uh, business logic. So so how would you do that? Um, and 
the answer is via a REST API, but what we're providing in, in kits is a special uh, invoke service API, which means node applications inside kits can, can get be optimised take advantage of the co-location uh, with, with, with um, kit services. Um, here's an example of, of a node uh, application which, which takes advantage of, you see the IBM Kix API is, is the module uh, provided by, by Kix uh, and a particular benefit of, of, of this API is it's transparent to, to the developer whether it's the target service is inside Kix or not. So th this solves a problem we, we took a long time to solve in Java, was uh, when developers are developing applications, they just want to fire up their laptop and test their application on their laptop without having to worry about there being a Kix region provisioned on it or a mainframe provisioned. And this API, uh, will be intelligent enough to detect whether it's running inside Kix or not. And if it's not running inside Kix, it will use a standard HTTP REST call uh, to call uh, the Kix service. If it is running inside Kix, uh, it will detect the local URI map and it can invoke a Kix application via a standard JSON pipeline as uh, support we've had for a number of releases now. And I think the best performance will be gained by using the, the non-Java JSON pipeline. Well, those of you familiar with the different pipelines yeah, we, we, sure. we make available. Um, so that one, will be, I think, will be particular suited um, to these types of applications. Okay, um, so I'm not going to say much more. I say Paul Cooper uh, will be here tomorrow and we'll go into this in much uh, greater depth. But is there any questions before we move on? Okay. So briefly, what's what's new in the Kix Explorer? Um, well, this was uh, those of you who are familiar with IBM design thinking will, will be familiar with the term held. This this is the this is the statement um, which Kix 5.5 has designed uh, to meet. So we're further addressing the, the gap in capability between the WUI and the Explorer. The WUI, as you may recall, um, is, is deprecated. Um, it's, it's not really being, being enhanced unless necessary, but there are still a number of gaps that the Explorer needs to fill. Um, but there's been a real effort uh, to go beyond just filling the gap and actually provide a much better experience in the Explorer than, than you get in the WUI. Uh, uh, I guess this is the the, the carrot uh, approach to get you to use the Explorer, uh, the, the stick being we're probably going to remove it at some point in the future. Um, but there's been a, a huge amount of work gone into providing two new functions in particular. Uh, the first of those is uh, aggregation. Um, now the WUI has s something similar in terms of the way it can summarise uh, some of the data. But what do we mean? in aggregation in, in the Explorer. Uh, th this is where you have a large uh, large amount of items in the screen, whether it's files, programs, etc. And basically too much data to, to be able to draw any helpful conclusions about what you're looking at. So I've got a quick animation here uh, to show you what you can do with ag aggregation in the Explorer in 5.5. Not the best example. What we're looking at here is the, the Kix task screen, and all we have here is, is some system tasks. So if you can imagine these are application tasks that might help. Um, you can see that uh, we're looking at system tasks across a, a Plex, so uh, we, we've got more than one instance of some of these uh, tasks. So by right-clicking on the column, and that this, this, this will work across uh, almost all uh, the views in the Explorer. Uh, we've got this new group by uh, option and you can see what's happened is the the task list has been shrunk so that there's only one entry for each unique uh, transaction id uh, and a count field has been introduced so you can see at a, a glance how many uh, tasks of, of that uh, 
Fran ID exist. Uh, as I say, this will work for files, programs, etc. Et, et, et so what we see is the other columns have been aggregated. Uh, so what does that mean? And in, in most cases, it means the differences uh, have been highlighted. Uh, so I think we're going to highlight. Uh, we can see that the the COBG uh, ta task um, is running with different user IDs. Uh, although they do have a U in common, apparently somewhere in the middle. Uh, but what we can then do is uh, do a further aggregation uh, and uh, aggregate on a second column, and we can repeat this process. But if we aggregate again, this time on the user ID column, you'll see that now there's two columns involved in, in specifying what the unique uh, instance of each entry is. So we, we now have two different entries for COBG uh, because they have different user IDs. So it's not the best example using Kip system tasks, but hopefully it gives you a flavour of, of uh, what's possible. As I say, most string-based uh, columns are aggregated on, on difference. But you see that the priority, uh, priority field looks a bit strange. That's priority 255.0. Uh, the, the reason for that, that being a numeric field, the, the, the default here has to be has been to aggregate it as an average. Uh, so that, that will work for all numeric fields. And uh, in addition to average, here are the different aggregation uh, functions know what the maximum is or the minimum or what the sum is. So quite a powerful addition uh, to the Explorer. Uh, so this is only available with 5.5. With, uh, with um, Can you say that it's a speed? Um, pass. Uh, but but, but Pr Prad at the back is nodding. Uh, so that I'll take that as a yes. Uh, um, Sophie is, 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 is doing the next presentation, so um, we'll get a lot more detail on, on what's possible with this in that session. The other uh, major improvement in the Explorer is, is in mapping. So those of you who remember the old TSO, CPSM, user interface, much beloved, uh, had a fantastic feature called Map, which took us a long time to recreate in, in the Wii. Some um, difference of opinion of how well that, 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 that worked out. Um, but we're now introducing a, a, a much better uh, map command uh, for the Explorer, which, which hopefully you'll see is much better than anything that's available uh, in the Wii. And that's for both workload management and BAS. Really? So uh, here's just a screenshot of, of the, the workload management uh, map command. Yeah, so what we have at the top, I don't know how, how well this reads at the back, but what we have at the top is uh, the WM spec, and then it's a kind of tree um, diagram. So underneath that spec, we can see what the default target scope is, all the workload groups, and within those groups, what the de workload depths are, and the transaction groups, and so on. So uh, and down at the bottom, uh, we have uh, the, what the routing regions for this workload are. So on one screen, we can see at a glance uh, everything uh, that makes up that uh, WM spec. Again, I'm sure Sophie will go into a far uh, more detail bill uh, in the next session. And just to finish off the Explorer, the, 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 these two features have only been possible by use of a new uh, query uh, API, uh, which the Explorer team are exploiting. It's called GraphQL. I think it's an open source um, uh, project. And the, the idea behind it is you can, with one request, you, you can request quite a complex set of data uh, returned. The, the, the client actually defines the format that the data should be returned in, and the, the engine figures out what's required to, to get that data back. Um, it does require um, a JVM uh, to work. So, um, what we're seeing now in 5.4 and 5.5 is the introduction of a JVM server, optional at the moment. Uh, it is required if you want to take advantage of aggregation and mapping, and it's also required for multi-factor authentication. Um, but this API, and, and it's an HTTP-based API, um, so it's open source, 
So in addition to the Explorer team taking advantage of it, it's also available to, to you, to customers, if, if you want to experiment uh, and, and write your own functions to, to return Kixplex data. Here's an example uh, of what the, the query looks like. Uh, this is quite a simple one because all we're querying is within the Kixplex, within the local transaction, uh, the records, and as I say, the client defines the data it wants back. Um, you can imagine more complex uh, queries which would be possible. And again, because the client defines what it needs back, uh, it can do it as, as one request as opposed to the existing RESTful API, CMCI API, would have, have to do multiple requests to return uh, the same data. Anyway, I think uh, it's a query language which the Explorer team are going to exploit further uh, going forward, so I think we can expect further improvements in, in Explorer. Okay. So that's, that's the Explorer. Any, any questions on that before we move on? So, so the question was, uh, WUI now has the option of, of, a, of, a, of a JVM server to, to provide this new function. Uh, just to clarify, it, that's, that's not mandatory, and it's certainly not at the moment. Uh, you will lose the function which it provides, uh, but you, there's a, I think there's a feature toggle um, available for the WUI to, to determine, and I think the default, I can't remember what the default is, so I won't say, I think it's changed a couple of times. Uh, but you can certainly switch that off and run, run without a JVM server. I sh should just say that the, the configuration for the WUI JVM server uh, is done for you. It's, it's not like you have to uh, create your own definitions to set this up. Uh, by setting that feature toggle, uh, you will uh, enable CPSM to do the configuration that's necessary to run that, that JVM server. Is there any movement in allowing you to interface to traditional source management stuff bundled rather than having to keep them in the explorer as well? So, um, so, the, so the, well, I, it depends what you mean. Um, when you say interaction with, with so so source code. Uh, manage your bundle along with all your traditional yeah. applications and your traditional source management. Yeah, products. okay, right. So we, we introduced something called a Kix Build Toolkit uh, a few releases ago, and 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 and, and, and that 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 and th there's also in something called DFH Deploy, and there's integration with source code management deployment tools like Urban Code Deploy. So you, you don't need the Explorer to do the deployment; uh, it, it can all be automated u using those those tools. Okay, so we'll move on to foundation items, and, and, and the first of those is uh, enhancements to Kix policies. This, this is just a summary of where we are with policies prior to 5.5. See, with each successive release, we've introduced uh, more and more uh, policy rules. And in 5.4, we introduced something called system rules um, and deprecated uh, system events. Um, so with policy system rules, you can do everything that you used to be able to do with the, the system events that were introduced in 4.2. Um, in 5.5, we're in, introduce, introducing additional uh, system rules. Uh, so so in these are in addition to those which have always been there as part of system events. Uh, you can now write system rules on the the status and enabled or availability of, of Kix bundles, take appropriate actions. Um, also both MRO and IPIC connections um, and enable status of a program resource. Um, also an interesting one is on the total number of A's. These are the control blocks which represent uh, tasks that need to run on a terminal. Um, we don't really have time to get into this, but, but there's, uh, this, is, this is part of a 
bigger piece of work to provide greater flexibility and control over the number of aids in a, in a kicks region. We've had a number of crit sits where, because we, there's no mechanism really to, to, to clear out uh, aids from, from a kicks region, which, which can lead to going short in storage, etc. Um, so. Did that come from RFE then? That came from it as an RFE, yes. Um, one aside is, is that one of the things we've done is to give you the ability to cancel uh, all the aids in a local system. But the way we've done that is uh, by a set connection command, which means that the local system is now being now discoverable as a connection in a KIPS region, something that's not the case currently. So if you, for example, require the connections in a 5.5 KIPS region, uh, you will see the local system okay. in the list. So it's, def it's something to be aware of when you come to migrate uh, to 5.5 and above. Okay, um, so the, the Workload Management Health API uh, was something we introduced in 5.4 and the idea here was to, to allow a kicks region which was newly started uh, a grace period before it, it was able to handle the, the, uh, a full workload. Um, and so, so effectively there's a warm-up uh, period when after control has been given to kicks this is configurable but but over a period of time you can set a health percentage uh, for uh, each kicks region and there's three types of workload which will take account of the health percentage of a region and, and uh, can be managed accordingly. Uh, the first of those is uh, TCPIP workload uh, this is managed by Kicks advertising to ZOS workload manager what its health percentage is, and therefore Sysfix, Sysfix distributor of TCPIP port sharing, uh, which use what ZOS workload manager will, will take that into account in, in terms of determining which is the best Kicks region to send a request. So that hasn't changed; that remains as is. It, but the other two types of workload have both been enhanced in 5.5. So that's CPSM workload management, uh, transaction routing or, or dynamic DPLs, uh, and uh, MQ, uh, MQ workloads which are managed by the, by the MQ monitor, the new MQ monitor resources which came in in 5.4. Um, so just to take these one at a time, so in, in 5.4 with CPSM workload management, um, CPSM would look at the health percentage of each target AOR and if the health percentage was 0%, which it would be after control was given, given to kicks, um, it will apply a high penalty weighting factor to that region. Um, so un unless all the target regions uh, had the same high penalty, no, no work would go uh, to that particular AOR un until its health increased above zero percent. As, as, as soon as it got above zero <coughs> percent, uh, there was no restriction on, on work that could be uh, routed to that target. So it's quite a binary um, uh, thing going on here. Uh, uh, either the region is zero percent and you don't want to route it or it's not zero percent and it's just the same as any other region. So that's been improved in uh, 5.5 to move be more granular. Um, and also the 0% means something different now. 0% in 5.5 means don't, do not route uh, to that target. Uh, so that, that is now a mechanism to ensure that no, certainly no workload from CPSM is routed to a particular AOR and, until its health to, uh, goes above 0%. The granularity comes between 1 and 99% uh, in that um, the, the algorithm CPSM uses to determine the best target uh, will, will be weighted according to the health percent. I think, uh, my understanding is that the, the max task value will be multiplied by the health percent and because max task is one of the factors used in uh, CPSM workload management, it should adjust the weight accordingly. 
So that's that can actually set, be set to yourself. Yes. So, so the it, 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 there's a set parameter and there's an SPI uh, command associated with it. The the, the, the set parameter um, sets uh, an interval and uh, an increment value uh, for the per for the percentage health of the region. Uh, I think the default is get these mixed up, it's either 20% and an increment of 25 or the other way around, uh, so that uh, it's, t it's purely time based, uh, so by, by default after a certain amount of time that the health will reach 100%, but there is an SBI command so you, you, can, uh, you can adjust that, the health percentage or those counts or intervals accordingly, uh, so you could, you, could, you could set the health for example to zero uh, using an SBI command. And how much load is it? Say 20 regions on a hot stand or a subject and health zero on an health body that we will use normally. Yeah. What would be the overhead of another system to having those hot stand by regions just dispatching by? The overhead to the other regions. So, um, the decision that has to be made, they will know I'm not going to talk to those. Is there basically, if you add loads of regions on a hot stand by, they will end up zero. Yeah. Is it uh -huh. your dispatching speed? Okay, well. So I, I, I guess it would be the same as uh, a, a workload which uh, you'd set targets to inactive, uh, the regions would be up but uh, CPSM can set targets to inactive so there, I, I can't imagine there would be, be much of an overhead of, of anything but uh, that's something to think about actually. I suppose it would be yeah. sensible to like a vending machine system in the where it would take those regions off the, the scan list. Yeah. yeah, they will be on the scale. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, the, the reason this, this come around is all really great with by four, but a lot of customers, um, for, for all different reasons, um, what they were they coming in. For example, um, your file statuses are all wrong. You come up and your automated operations has got like a heartbeat, and you don't want the kitchen to accept work in this mobile world. Yes, that's because the, the, there was quite a bit made about the increments and setting the palms in the set. You can make it go up to hundred. So but yeah, so it's um, on off. well, the the, the TCP/IP workload uh, management takes account of all those increments in, in five four, as does as does MQ, ah. but CPSM didn't. However, when we get to continuous delivery at the end, there's a nice surprise. Okay, that's CPSM. Um, so as I say, the other the other workload which takes advantage of of health is is MQ. Uh, at five point four, uh, we're not starting uh, MQ monitor resources until health goes above zero percent. So MQ monitors will be trigger monitors or DPL bridges. You could write something else yourself, but just think of them as like those two things uh, for for, the, for uh, this purpose. Um, and as the region uh, health increases, the, the connections uh, associated with these monitors um, are throttled. And here's uh, the way they're throttled is both, both trigger monitors and DPL bridges uh, have a monitoring task which does MQ gets off the queue. And so the, the throttling is based on the number of gets which are, uh, can be issued uh, per second. Uh, so the algorithm. Uh, when health is uh, going from zero to 100 is the percentage and uh, max task times two per second. Uh, if you work that out, if the, if the, if the region is 50% healthy, it will be uh, the number, number of gets per second will be equal to max task and so on. So the improvement in 5.5 is, is to add an additional throttle if, if the region actually reaches max task. And if a region reaches max task, again, we're going to introduce a throttle, uh, which is currently set to max task plus 10%. So it's an additional improvement for MQ. Okay, any questions on health before we move on? The health is there, therefore, reset once the 
Yes, yeah, so, 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 so when a region is shutting down health, uh, I think health is set to 0% uh, immediately. Uh, and so uh, some of these workloads will, will, should stop sending work. Okay, so some uh, smaller items. So exec kicks delay. Enhancement here is uh, to run, return a new res2 value if that delay has been cancelled uh, by uh, another task. Another task comes in and cancels uh, that delay. That's that's now visible uh, to the, the program that's in the, the task that's in the delay. Um, that's just one of the results we've got to tell you that doesn't have well, that response. So. Okay, so uh, it's not switching. You can't switch that off. Uh, but it, it is an ind additional risk to value. So if, uh, if you're not checking for that additional value, hopefully no impact to your current programs. Um, maybe a, a more interesting one, so um, task purge. Um, sure, many of you have been in the position where you've purged the task in kicks and the yeah. thread in DB2 is still active and uh, things start to get bad after that. No longer a feature, actually. <laughs> um, so, Current advice is to cancel the thread in DB2 before you push the task in kicks. That's, that's a two-step process and probably involves multiple different people, etc. Um, so this improvement in 5.5 is for kicks to do the cancel thread uh, uh, for you. Uh, kicks will detect if the task is, is currently active in DB2, and if it is, it will issue uh, the cancel thread. And only then will it issue uh, the purge or force purge. Uh, both kicks and DB2 have been enhanced to support this, so that this will only be available uh, with both the kicks maintenance and the DB2 maintenance, uh, with, 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 with without either, or one or either, uh, the old behaviour will prevail. Is there any enhancement in the system of inputs yet to the detect DB2 value and still? DB2. Oh, I see, right. So, um, so not not specifically. I mean, policies can check response time, but but that that's that's quite generic. Um, I think I'll look round the room for any <laughs> insight, but I I don't think I don't know there's anything to specifically check. Uh, can, can a Megamon do that? Oh, you don't run a Megamon. But, uh, but uh, I suspect a Megamon might be able to do that. I mean, there's, there's almost certainly things you can do in DB2. I, I, I don't know, but I imagine there is. Okay, um, some other enhancements. Um, so PLTs no longer need to be assembled. More of that in a second. I've already mentioned multi-factor authentication for CMCI, that's what requires, that also requires um, the JVM server in the GUI. Um, and enhancement to monitoring, so we're introducing resource level monitoring for URI maps and web services, so like you can do today with files and TSQs, so a, a, a task, um, you can obviously uh, access more than one file, so we have resource monitoring. At a file level, uh, which is of each task, we're introducing that for your IMAPs and web services because tasks uh, can obviously now access more than one external service, so you now have the ability to monitor these separately. So I mentioned PLTs. Uh, so going forward, uh, Kicks will no longer look for a load module uh, for PLT. Uh, it will look for effectively a source uh, module and this, the syntax which is supported is, is the exact syntax you use today uh, for your PLTs. Um, 
So the PL, so uh, it, it will either look in a, a Parmlib member, which is the uh, Sys1 Parmlib, or in anything that's concatenated uh, to Sys1 Parmlib at IPL, uh, or a specific DD card, which we've introduced called DFH table. Um, so to ease migration, as I say, uh, the, the syntax which you currently have uh, for your PLTs uh, uh, is, is what's accepted. Um, but we've also introduced an enhancement uh, for you may, may wish to take advantage of going forward and, and that the PLT, PI and SD shut down uh, set parameters will now accept more meaningful names for your PLTs. If you wanted to go crazy and name your PLTs uh, something other than two characters, you can now do so. Um, another nice enhancement, I think, is uh, Inquire system will now return uh, the last uh, startup times for each different type of start. I need my glasses for this. Uh, so I don't know if this is uh, readable, but uh, what this is showing is that uh, we can easily see the last time the region was cold started, the last time it was emergency started, that actually hasn't been, the last time it was initial started, and the last time it was warm started. Uh, so that's now information at your fingertips, which is pretty hard to, to, to find previously. And that's also available in all the usual places, uh, Explorer, etc. in the SBI. Okay, um, so we've got just over 10 minutes left. So I do want to cover this one. Um, so a number of customers have raised a, a requirement to uh, be able to police the API particularly the API commands, uh, which the, their applications are able to, uh, to use. Uh, an example might be um, disallow execx link with sysid. So, so if you, uh, want, uh, you want to do a dynamic link, you don't want the, the application deciding what the sysid is. Uh, also, as we've introduced new API commands, uh, uh, some, some shops want the ability uh, to disallow those new API commands until they have standards in place uh, to properly support them. So this is the way the translator works today. It takes in the language tables and the source code, assembles the API, and SP, uh, translates the API and SPI commands, and you get the output. So new behavior. This is this is completely optional. So you don't need to uh, take advantage of this if you don't want to. Uh, but we're now adding a third input uh, to the translator um, uh, to provide a list of restricted commands. And if, if the program has one of those restricted commands, then either a warning message can be issued or the, the translate can fail. Uh, that, that depends on uh, the syntax uh, for the command in the list of, um, in the list of commands you want to, <coughs> to disallow or warn it. Warn it. So these statements uh, need to go in a, a ZOS Parma member DF, called DFH APIR. Um, and the, if, if the translator detects that this uh, member uh, exists in the Parma concatenation, it will uh, act accordingly. So there's no JCL changes uh, required uh, to enable this behavior. Uh, the, the existence of the Parma member is, is what enables it. Um, it's been done at the translator time to make sure there's no um, runtime uh, hits. Obviously, we're doing this at translate time, not not at runtime. So it's been tested for uh, those in racket. So, um, yes, is 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 a short answer, uh, and and th th this, this this may be enhanced further. I don't know uh, uh, to do that, but what we have today is uh, some granularity on. on uh, who those restricted commands are applied to. Um, so you can uh, define a new profile in the facility class called DFH APIR. Uh, if, if there is no, if, if a user had, uh, does not have read access to that profile, it means that user is, is, is need, uh, needs to comply with restrictions. Uh, users, you want to be able to bypass those restrictions. Yeah, so you know all the restrictions for that. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does this risk you bring stuff like shell effects? 
So I've, this is something I've heard from one of your colleagues at RBS. Um, okay. So J John Barrett has talked about this in the past because um, uh, the uh, development support team have got standards. Uh, um, they may have done something themselves. Uh, I, I speak to John in the past, they do something w when programs are, are compiled to, to, to check for uh, bad, so bad practice. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, the, the example I stated earlier, the exec start with society, I think is one that, that uh, RBS look out for. So this would be a simpler way to, to catch it. So it's as granular as a, as a LPA, yes. Okay, with one eye on the clock. Um, we've managed to squeeze another thread safe enhancement into this release. So a couple of facility data tables, uh, access to those is now uh, thread safe. So if that's an inhibitor, uh, that's, that's removed in 5.5. Um, security and re resilience, very briefly, um, there's been some enhancements to the, the way Kix allows applications to submit jobs to the spool. Uh, some of you know there's two ways to do this, spool write or the write QTD to uh, uh, the internal reader. We're introducing a new surrogate check, so in addition to the existing one, um, which means the Kix region user ID needs authority uh, to submit a job on behalf of another user. Uh, now, the signed on user who is actually running the task that, that, that writes to the, the spool of, of DB, uh, that user also needs uh, authority to submit a job on another user. Uh, there's a feature toggle for migration purposes. If you don't want this behavior uh, on day one, you can switch it off, uh, but it does does address a, a potential security risk. Yeah. Um, another change is the change to the default job user ID. So, so this is where you don't specify the user on, on the job card. Uh, currently, the job will be submitted under the, the user ID of the Kix region. Uh, that behavior is changing, say, for, for, so for spool write. Uh, we'll talk about TD in a second. For spool write, the default user will become the signed on user. Not the, not the region ID. Uh, again, there's a migration option, a, a feature toggle to switch this off, uh, to give you time to work it, but again, it's, it's a, a sen sensible security enhancement. Uh, the change to write QTD is, is different because we already, we can already do resource level security against the TDQ, but the, the, an enhancement to the TDQ definition is to provide a job user ID parameter so you can, if you, if you need a particular uh, set of jobs to run on a certain user ID, uh, you can specify that in the TDQ uh, definition. Oh, you won't know if you just strip, strip out new syslet forms that don't allow people to surreptitiously submit them to another system and start the yeah. system user ID. Okay, I think I'll mention this one briefly because it came up uh, before, we were, before we started. Uh, CSN, there's a new option on the SIP parameter uh, to stop, stop you dropping it into a, a Kix clear screen if you drop out the CSN. Uh, instead, the disconnect option will take you right out. So I'm going to skip to the end because we're running out of time. Uh, so these files are available uh, on the the GSE download site. I just wanted to make sure we covered uh, continuous delivery. Uh, <coughs> uh, so say ev every quarter uh, we announce uh, the set of function that's been made, made available to current releases of Kix and it's, it's usually limited to the latest release which is still 5.4. Uh, but sometimes there's function uh, uh, backported further back. Um, so we've got a summary, summary here of, of what we've actually made available this year just pick some of them out. Uh, so we talked about system rules uh, for Kix policy as a replacement for system events. So that has been made available right back to 5.1, uh, ACAR numbers listed. 
Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but see, see the, for example, the new policy system rules for programmes, bundles, etc. Uh, that's available in 5.4. Um, we talked about uh, CPSM exploitation of the WN Health API. So that new behaviour, that 5.5 behaviour, is available to 5.4 um, with that APAR there. And we also talked about uh, KEX canceling the DBT threads. That's available right back to 5.1. Uh, so if you want that behaviour, then you can get that all the way back. Okay, so that's more or less everything I had. Uh, Nick, did you want to say something about uh, the 5.5? Events? Um, yeah. No, I'll tell you as I know. Right, okay. <laughs> eh? I can't hear, sorry. No, no, I, you, you said something last night about a uh, uh, get together in London. Um, right, um, so if you were in um, the, the session with Will Yates yesterday, you would have heard him talk about Meetup and meetup.com, this is where people who have a, a, a common interest in, in any topic, doesn't have to be actually IT, but the, the, a, a meetup would be arranged uh, in a venue and people from all, all over the place would meet up. And there's typically a presentation of some, some description to, as a hinge to, to that event, but it's more for the discussion and interaction. Now. There hasn't been one for mainframes, mainframers, Z, ZOS, whatever you want to call it. And so uh, in Hursley, we, a few of us got together and we've introduced um, mainframe Z as a, a meetup group. And we're planning to bring together uh, a bunch of people. Probably the first one will take place in London because there's, there's more of a hub there, but it's not restricted to London. It could be, Anywhere, anywhere uh, in, in Britain and hopefully around the world if it gets that successful. But it's, it's brand new, there's a web page there. Um, I've got some cards in the other room, the regular room, hung all ring. Um, so I can distribute those in a different session. I had overlooked the fact that this session was taking place in this room. So that's why I don't have them with me. No okay, well just a quick reminder that Five five will be available on the twentieth of December, and between now and then you'll see the document the knowledge centre uh, be beefed up, and all uh, there'll be new collateral made available in the, in the usual places. So, with that, well, thank you, and uh, I hope to see you in the other sessions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sir.